Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Tanya Bork, and I will be presenting um, Start Engagement with the Best recruit Recruitment Practices. Um, please bear with me. I have a little bit of a cold this morning, or this afternoon, rather. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the presentation and then take questions periodically um, after a certain number of slides. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about... Um, you know, why it's important to have the best recruitment practices and what does that ha how does that translate into engagement? So why does engagement first start with recruitment practices? Um, you've got to think of first contact. You know, from when the first time a person reaches out to a company or a company reaches out to a person about a job, um, how do they feel about that contact? That contact? Um, the recruitment practices that happen in between that first, the first contact and um, onboarding and the first day of work. So everything that kind of happens in between. And then, you know, your first day of work and so on. So let's talk about how, how did you make that first contact? <coughs> did the candidate apply directly to your company? Um, you know, did they go onto your website and, and, and apply, or did they find a job ad? Um, did you find the candidate's resume on a job board or a website and then, and then made the contact? Did the candidate apply through a third-party agency, or was the candidate an employee referral? So if the candidate applied, how long did the application take? them to submit their application. So just here's a little bit of data um, on applicant tracking systems and some other information that's useful. So 75% of recruiters and hiring professionals use a recruiting or applicant tracking system. 94% of recruiters and hiring professionals say that their ATS or recru recruiting software has, a positive, uh, has pod positively impacted their hiring process. Only 4% will say that it has a negative impact or negative effect. However, this is really different with what job seekers and applicants are feeling. So as you can see, 80% um, of them describe their online job search <coughs> and online um, applications as stressful. 60% um, of... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I apologize. 60% um, of, of job, um, job candidates are unable to complete their online application due to encountering some technical hurdles. <coughs> as many as 75% of qualified applicants are rejected by ATSs due to specious reasons like um, incorrect resume formatting. Um, Sixty percent of uh, applicants quit an online application because it's too complex or too long, while seventy percent of applications um, applicants feel that the online application should be five steps or fewer. Only forty percent of employers think the same way. So this is this is a huge contrast if you if you think about <coughs> what businesses are actually doing versus what applicants feel businesses should be doing. So almost 40% of recruiters and hiring managers have not, have not gone through the application process on their own website to test it. This is a big deal. Um, if you don't know what your candidates are going through, how can you empathize or help them? So as a requirement, um, every recruiter should go through the application process. Um, every hiring manager should test out the application process. And this also gives you a good idea of what's, what's going on the outside. Um, in one test, <coughs> a company created a perfect resume for an ID candidate for a clinical scientist role. Um, it scored a mere 43% relevance because the ATS um, it was submitted to misread it. So this kind of gives you an idea that automation isn't all it's cracked up to be, and a lot of mistakes are happening through electronic systems. 
and we're missing out on applicants because of it. We're also not providing the best candidate experience. So in another test, one large firm found that the resumes of three out of five of their top engineers were screened out automatically by their ATS as not relevant. So these are some really scary statistics. <coughs> now, another question that I have is your application available on mobile devices. Um, a lot of people are abandoning computers for tablets, iPads, and cell phones. And um, if your application is not on mobile, you're missing out on a large number of applicants. Applications shouldn't take any longer than five minutes to complete. And resumes should be able to be parsed. Um, and that means that you shouldn't have to enter all of the data that's on your resume again. It just takes too long. It's important to make the application process as simple as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and check and see if there's any questions in the audience. Um, does anyone have any questions as of yet? I'm going to give about a moment or two. Okay, no questions. So um, how did you connect with your with the candidate once you source them and this is they didn't apply directly they're passive um, you know what did you do now are you personalizing your messages or are you just sending a whole bunch of bulk emails from nowhere it's always a, a great idea um, and always the best practice to personalize your message and when you're personalizing your message you want to do some research on your candidates and get to know them a little a little bit better. Um, and then after you've, d you've done personalizing that message, even if they are not interested in the job, how are you staying connected? Are you, um, are you keeping up with them on a regular basis? Are you, um, how are you staying in touch? And these are just some really important things to keep in mind. I want to talk about this, um, and, and this really bothers me um, quite a bit, um, more so nowadays than ever, as I get a lot of connection requests. Um, so unless you really know the person, <coughs> you really shouldn't be sending them this generic LinkedIn request. It's always a better idea to personalize that request. Um, you know, hi, Brian, I saw your profile here, um, we met at this event, and always you know, try to give as much detail as possible in that request. You're more, um, you're more likely to get your request accepted if you're providing those details. Yep, personalization really um, helps build relationships. Um, this is a really cool um, personalized email um, from, a, from a recruiter to a candidate. And as you can see, um, this recruiter did a lot of research on this candidate, um, provided you know some of the detail of that research, and you know really went into detail as into what that you know what they're looking for, and um, really left it open for the candidate to to reach out or to connect back. Um, you know, they talked about the the projects that the candidate um, completed, and in this case, Peter. You know, Peter had a bunch of projects. Talked about, you know, the company and what they're looking for and, and really gave a lot of detail as to why the contact, the contact was a fit. So, you know, fit goes both ways. It's, it's got to be a good fit for the candidate and for the, um, for the recruiter, for the company. Fit is not a, a one-way street. So you want to keep it s simple and sweet, and this is just some, you know, general guidelines for contact. Uh, for contact. You know, um, if you're calling a candidate, voicemail should be short and focused, you know, 30 to 45 seconds tops. <coughs> um, emails should be kept to two to three short paragraphs. 
you know, Facebook messages, if you're, if you're reaching out to candidates through Facebook, you know, two to three casual sentences. And messages on Twitter, you know, limit it to 140 characters. And you want to kind of stay away from any job-related um, info until you've actually engaged in that conversation. And this is, um, this is information coming from DICE. Um, all right. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'm going to stop for a moment and check on if there's any questions. No questions? Okay. So I want to talk about personalized um, Twitter messages. Now, you can use Twitter <coughs> to engage with, um, you know, with potential candidates. Um, it's not recommended that you just spit out jobs because no one is really going to, to see them if you have a lot of connections. They're, you know, it's hard to get those shared and get those viewed. It's, it's a really a waste. And when I say spit out jobs, you know, you go ahead and you pay, post a link for someone to apply and say, I have this opening. That's what I mean by posting jobs. It's, um, it's really a good idea to post stories about your organization or the technology um, or technology and industry related posts. You also want to engage in conversation with people in your company's in industry and get to know them and get them to refer people to you. Um, it's, it's really all about building that relationship. You want to go ahead and learn, you, learn to use hashtags properly. Um, you have a greater chance of your post being viewed if you're using them properly. And you want to build a following. And I don't recommend paying for followers. Um, you want to follow and be followed. <coughs> So another practice I wanted to talk talk about was third party agencies um, that you that you may or may not work with. Um, you want to talk about how they treat the treat the candidates. Um, I'm going to give you a really good example. I get a lot of messages um, day in and day out for jobs, and sometimes I respond to them just to see what other agencies are like. And the one thing that I, I found was a lot of agencies were submitting my resume to companies just based on emails. They weren't talking to me. They weren't getting to know me. They, um, they were just sending out resumes. They were sending out these mass emails with a lot of questions, like a questionnaire to fill out, and then sending my resume out to the, um, to the companies. And, and that really disturbed me because they had no clue if I was a real person, if my my, you know, if any of the details on my resume matched my LinkedIn profile, um, you know, anything at all about me other than the questionnaire that they sent out to me and, um, and, the res and my resume. So I, I found that to be really disturbing. And um, it made me feel that the quality of the candidate experience really went down um, when this happened. I never really got to talk to a real recruiter. And... It's going gonna, it's gonna to be very disturbing for anybody who's working on the other side of corporate and receiving these resumes, and they realize that the candidate doesn't know anything about the position. The candidate doesn't know very much about the company. All they know is that their resume has been submitted for this role, and this is the salary, and this is the location. Another thing you want to take a look at is if they outsource. Um, I I remember when I was job searching, I would get a lot of robocalls. And when I mean robocalls, it would be agencies from the other side of the world. You know, there weren't recruiters working in the U.S. They were working um, in India or China or Russia. And I would get a lot of these calls, and I couldn't understand a word that some of the recruiters were saying. And so I thought that this was a really bad practice, um, you also want to talk to them about how they're screening the candidates. Um, are they screening the candidates properly? Do they have someone on board who can do technical screenings if it's an engineering role? These are really, really um, important things to ask. Um, you also want to acquaint them with your company as much as possible. Give them as much information as possible so that they can, you know, 
provide the candidates with really good information. So I also ask, um, and when I was in corporate, I would ask, well, what's the resume to fit ratio? You know, how many resumes are they submitting to me that fit the position and how many are just junk? And, and that's something to also consider. <clears throat> and you might ask, well, why is this important to the um, candidate engagement and experience? Well, if, if agencies are submitting resumes um, to hiring managers that aren't a fit and not getting back to those candidates, you know, those candidates are going to have a bad candidate experience, and that reflects on your organization as well. So another factor is you want to look at how they source profiles. Like where, does it, where, where do their resumes come from? Are they calling people off of job boards? Are they um, connecting people on, you know, connecting people through LinkedIn? Are they, <coughs> do they have their own database? All right, I'm going to move forward with the next slide. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay. So here's some more statistics to keep in mind. Um, on average, you know, every corporate job opening attracts 250 resumes. Four to six of these people will be will be called, um, you know, for an interview, and only one will be offered a job. Obviously, um, here are five things that job seekers take into account um, when accepting a job offer. You know, salary and compensation, of course, career growth opportunities, work life balance, location, commute, um, company culture, and values. So it's really important to communicate as much information as possible um, to candidates, and that's how you're providing them a really good experience. 94% um, of sales professionals say that the base salary is the most important element of their compensation plan. So if you're you know, recruiting a lot of sales professionals, this is something to keep in mind. Now, only 62% of sales professionals said that commission is the most important factor. People generally want to know, and this can go for any position that you're working on that has a bonus or a variable component, they want to know what their take-home pay is going to be at the, at the very worst. So 79% of job seekers use social media in their search. Um, this is also a really important factor. Um, if you're not using social media in, to attract candidates, then you're really – you're really far behind the rest of your, your peers. 86% um, of younger job seekers who are in the first 10 years of their um, career use social media um, to find a job. Now, this next statistic is kind of, um, kind of scary. It says two in three employee, employees say their employer does not, does not um, or does not know how to use social media to promote job openings. So we're really missing out on a large pool of people by not promoting things properly. And um, here's some other statistics. 45% uh, of job seekers use their mobile, mobile devices to search for jobs, at least once a day. You know, 54% uh, read company reviews on their mobile, and 52% research salary information. And this is how mobile devices are being used in the job search. You know, that 54% that's reading company reviews is also reading about interview reviews and application process. So how one, one candidate is treated um, can really affect your entire process just by really one, one bad review. And word of mouth spreads very fast. So when recruiting millennials, there's, you know, three things that you want to look, you know, they want to look, they're looking for um, in a company. And they want to know about the growth um, opportunities, retirement benefits, and, cult and work culture. The second one kind of surprised me, but um, 
you know, there's a lot of companies that aren't offering a 401k match, and that's become a very big, um, you know, a very big thing that a lot of candidates have asked me about. So another very interesting thing um, with millennials is 64% would take a, a lesser salary if they were in a job that they loved versus a really high salary in a job that they thought was boring. That's another reason why it's really important to provide as much information as possible. So, um, you know, here's some other, other statistics um, about millennials and um, other job seekers as well. Now, this is a really interesting one, number, uh, number 10. 69% of job seekers will not take a job with a company with a bad reputation, even if they're unemployed. And 84% would consider leaving their current job if they were offered a job with an excellent reputation. So reputation is everything. So if you're, you know, increasing your employee engagement by 10%, you're, on, on average, you know, you're incre increasing, you know, company profits by $2,400 for an employee. Um, and that's what statistics have found. <clears throat> All right, um, before I forward over to the next slide, are there any questions? Oh, okay, I have one question. Are there any other statistics on, on time to fill or the challenge in filling commission sales jobs roles or specific engagement practices? Um, well, I don't have any statistics in my slides. But um, it, it really depends what type of sales roles that you're filling. I've done a lot of pre-sales roles, and those require someone with an engineering background who can do sales. And there are you know, statistics to that. It really depends on your process. So if you have a very long hiring process, it will obviously take you more time to fill. If it's a really niche um, type of sales role, it'll take, it'll definitely take you more time to fill. I've seen um, those type of searches go from anywhere to three to six months, depending on, you know, what type of sales it is. So um, if you'd like, I can provide you some more information on that if you, you'd like to email me at the end and we can go from there. So another, um, another thing I want to talk about is employee referrals and how they're handled. So you want to make this process very simple, um, mainly because it's, employees are referring their friends to come work at, at, your com at the company that they're working at, and you want them to feel really good about doing that. And you want to provide really good incentives to get referrals. And usually it's, a, it's monetary compensation. I've seen anywhere from $500 to $2,000 for a referral um, within different organizations. A really cool thing about employee referrals is that it's the least expensive way to hire. And you're seven times more likely to be hired than a general applicant. Employee referrals are generally a lower cost than any other source, um, which is also really good to consider. So um, here's just a couple of, um, you know, different campaigns that, that are out there. Um, there's a lot of them. The really cool one that I've seen lately is um, having an event and bringing a friend to interview. And that's become increasing, increasingly popular at a variety of different organizations, and even has helped um, certain companies with diversity. So here's some really two, two really neat com campaigns. Um, you know, the first one outlines the instructions on how to refer someone. The second one is more of a, a bland campaign, um, saying that at, at this day and this time we're having an event. And these are all of the biggest complaints about recruiting um, from applicants. And if you look at each and every one of these, it all, all revolves around two things, automation and improved communication. 
So all of these things can be really remedied if we improve our communication process. And we improve our application process and we let people know where they are in the process. So I just wanted to, you know, provide some closing thoughts and um one thing I did want to say that it's really important to personalize your your messages. Um, you know, provide more of a human touch. We have all of this technology, um, yet we're not reaching out to candidates properly. We're we're missing we're missing people that would be really great for our organizations. We're making the process a lot more complicated than it needs to be, and that's one thing that we really need to look into. And the best way to look into it is to test your own process. See how long it takes to go through the application process. See, see what it feels like to be an applicant. And if something isn't, doesn't you know, sink in with you, then make a suggestion to have that fixed. I'm not saying you know, revamp a whole process, but, but keep your process simple. And you want to communicate as much as possible. Even if you're doing this through automation, you need to let candidates know where they are in the process. And, and acknowledge that they took the time to fill out an application or to, you know, or to express interest in talking to you about a position. All right. I just wanted to thank everyone for their time. I know that it's been really short. I'm going to just see if anybody has any questions before I close out. Okay, I'm going to give it about another minute. Um, All right. Um, thank you, everyone, who joined the presentation. Um, if you have any questions or you know need any help at all, my email address is um, you know right above. Feel free to contact me anytime. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn as well. Thank you very much.